Hi, Fariha. You're on mute. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Game Cho, Namaste, whoever is listening, because we are doing an EDI event. So I thought it's better to welcome everyone with some positivity today. So thank you, everyone, for joining. I would like to welcome all the panelists, speakers, uh, everyone, the attendees who have registered to the event, to a beautiful event this morning with the sunny, um, you know, with the sunshine. Embrace it dignify it and inspire it. Equality, diversity, inclusion is something that we've been talking about a lot last year and this year. So from Dynamo Northeast, we thought, why not take it a bit further and share with you and make you all come together to speak about it. Without further ado, let me just pass this over to our opening speaker, Emma white and Stoll, And uh, she's uh, from, she's representing Dynamo. I would hand it over to Emma. So thank you, Emma. And I'll see you just in a minute. Thank you, Faria. <laughs> so, um, hi everybody and welcome to this uh, wonderful event this morning. Uh, Faria has asked me to give a little bit of a background and introduction as to how this all came about for Dynamo. Um, so, Dynamo's EDI journey started um, at the, the last year with, with a bit of a wake-up call, if we're honest, um, in the form of a challenge via Twitter by an influential and award-winning EDI consultant, actually, over the lack of ethnic diversity on our conference lineup. So this uncomfortable challenge and the um, subsequent constructive discussion we had with her kicked off an internal review led by Sarah Thackeray and myself, um, looking at not just our events, but our organization as a whole and how we could become more inclusive from our policies, our messaging to our team and our board. We realized that as a tech uh, network representing the Northeast of England, we needed to do more to ensure we're representing our diverse society and support our members and the wider community in the region to do the same. So Dynamo took action. We started through consultation with our advisory board and agreed to set up an equality, diversity and inclusion working group. The group consists of key Dynamo members and influential tech organizations in the region such as Sage, Capgemini, Ubisoft, BT, Tombola, alongside members of the regional universities, who I'd like to thank all of them now for their time and their valuable input. The group shared best practice and took a collaborative approach to scoping out the focus and priorities of this project. And it was agreed that a starting point should be a piece of research to define the current picture of diversity in the sector in the region and um, have a benchmark to work from from there. So it was at this point last year, I had the pleasure, absolute pleasure of meeting Faria through her wonderful work at the charity Being Woman and their new venture Share Caro, which is a food sharing app that they set up during lockdown. She just blew me away with her passion and ambition, but also her authenticity and kindness. And at that point she was invited to join the team at Dynamo as our very first EDI manager. So Faria's worked tirelessly ever since consulting with the sector to inform the report that she's gonna share with you today. She created a plan of activity, producing some engaging, informative and sometimes challenging content through her blogs and podcasts, which I urge you to check out if you haven't already. And I'm sure um, Claire will drop the links into the chat for you to do that. She's also looked for the good and created the wonderful hero campaign, identifying some role models in the region and sharing their unheard stories with the community. So all of these different strands of activity form part of Dynamo's EDI action plan which thanks to Faria's hard work, keeps equality, diversity and inclusion firmly in the spotlight. We want to make a difference in the sector and support our members to take an inward look, drive positive action and change within their organizations. We believe that a diverse workforce brings diversity of thinking, leading to growth and innovation. And when we talk about diversity, we're not just talking about gender or race, but inclusion of all individuals representing all protected characteristics. And I'm pleased to say that we have an amazingly diverse panel of speakers here today who can talk with lived experience from all perspectives. It's a real pleasure to have with us today, Dr. Sue Black, award-winning computer scientist, technology evangelist and digital skills expert. Nigel Morley, DEI manager for the UK and Ireland at SAGE. Caroline Fox, global EDI strategy lead at 10th Revolution Group. Shakira Takir, the wonderful from the wonderful Tech Up Women program, 
Sean Foy, the Northeast Senior Manager from the British Business Bank and internationally respected mental health advocate, national policy advisor and social entrepreneur, Poppy Jammon OBE. And before I hand back over to Faria to talk through this groundbreaking report, I'd like to thank Claire and the team at Dynamo as well for all their hard work and support putting this event on. So Faria, over to you. Thank you so much, um, Emma. It was lovely to hear from you. And thank you so much for your kind words. Um, you know, we did meet, as Emma has said last year, through, um, through a Twitter challenge, as you say. Um, I really want to thank the person, all those people who are involved in putting through this initial findings report, we have carried out work. One thing that we were very focused at Dynamo was that we wanted to take a very unique approach to equality, diversity and inclusion. We thought the first thing that comes from equality is embracing it. Once we embrace it, then it's the next step how we dignify it. And then from there, we take the inspiration. So it's a step process. It does not happen overnight. It is something which is deeply rooted in all of us, is just a matter of bringing it on. So this is why we carried out an initial findings research survey with the tech sector. Obviously we had a very short time and uh, this was just a project that we were working on. Uh, so we are going to present today the initial findings that I've compiled in a report. The report is also going to be available from Dynamo. So if you would like to get a hold of your copy, please do get in touch. Before that, I would like to thank all of the panelists today who have come and joined us in this um, a collaborative event because we believe that we can't do everything on our own. We can't fix things overnight around equality, diversity, inclusion. But yes, one thing that we are very sure of, we can do it together and we can accept it. There's so much room for it. So let me just uh, share my findings and we'll go through it uh, together. So um, just bear with me for a moment and... Here you go. So this is the uh, our initial findings report of equality, diversity and inclusion. It's uh, it's an initial findings report. So I've tried to be as authentic as I can be uh, when I was compiling it. And uh, as I said, Dynamo has taken a unique approach in embrace it, dignify it and inspire it. Uh, there were so many uh, table of contents that we've compiled so you can read your report. I really want to thank Emma uh, to be here, but I also want to thank Sarah Thakre, who's the director at Dynamo Northeast for her support and for her understanding of her and for her authenticity. So both Emma and Sarah has been with me throughout this. It is a collaborative effort and I must say I would not have been able to do it if they would not be there. If they would not be there. This is our initial findings of, uh, report. What is the background and aim? I'll just go through very briefly. So obviously following the events of 2020, um, I see that there's no better time now uh, for the employers, for the organizations to embrace diversity and inclusion as a key business priority. And obviously, not only that the country has went, the country went into lockdown last year, and we all have seen some very, um, you know, we have faced challenges. Uh, we have also come together uh, and spoke about a lot of issues in the same way there were some key issues that were uh, that came forefront uh, in terms of diversity and inclusion. The one was the global Black Lives Matter movement that had a huge impact on all of us. It also symbolized the fact that many members of the Black Asian minority ethnic communities um, that it, it brought the it, it highlighted the systemic disadvantage that the black Asian minority ethnic uh, communities feel not only with the police but also with the public institutions and organizations and it's mainly not because of the color of this it's, it's because of the color of the skin rather than their attributes as an individual so north uh, as Di emma was saying dynamo northeast wanted to play uh, their part in uh, diversifying the northeast tech sector and we wanted to undertake the work to understand further the current perceptions and experiences of northeast tech sector both internally and externally within communities but one thing that we were very focused on throughout was the protected characteristics covered under the um, because I believe, and as Dynamo, we believe that not only 
focusing on one strand of the Equality Act would not lead us anywhere. The more inclusive we are, the better we are going to be uh, talking about equality, diversity, but not only talking, but also promoting it within our cultures. I've also in the report, you would see a brief highlight of the Equality Act and the protected characteristics that come in the, under it. The structure of the work and methodology was there were it was divided into three distinct interrelated areas. Firstly, we wanted to provide a snapshot uh, of the current position and also to understand we wanted to hear from the staff at different levels within the Northeast sectors organizations and to understand their perceptions, to understand their experiences. Um, we also did the blogs and the podcast and video series as well uh, consistently throughout this just to know what are the amazing work that the people are already doing in the sector because sometimes it's good that, you know, we are providing such a brief snapshot and uh, putting up results, but it's also very important to highlight the good work that's been carried out in the Northeast so far. This is the brief snapshot of the um, report with the total responses of the survey were 142. And if you can look at it, 67.6%, that was 96 were men who participated in the survey and 27.5% were women. And uh, it's quite surprising, uh, but not as shocking to me and obviously to uh, the people who are attending today that the ethnic minority background representation was very low. It might be that the survey could not reach out to a lot of people or obviously we had very, uh, you know, if you compare it, we could not reach to more. And as I said, this is the initial findings and the second strand would come after that. Uh, we also did You Are a Hero project, which was uh, it is just an initiative aimed to build a digital archive to recognize our unsung heroes and role models who play a very important role in the Northeast, making it diverse, equal and inclusive. So this was also the part of the external research because we wanted to highlight our unsung heroes. We are very proud and delighted to feature the dignified and inspirational heroes from the diverse talent we have in the tech sector of the Northeast. Hero was a project which was formed on the four strands. We wanted people to be honest. We wanted people to represent the great work they've been and their thoughts around equality. We wanted to respect their views and we wanted them to be to have an openness and an open-minded uh, view when they were putting into the hero questionnaires. And we are very delighted that we have had extremely wonderful entries for that. The first one we want to feature is Nicorelli, who's also our panel member today, who's a Chief Technology Officer at NHS Business Authority. Thank you so much, Nick, for filling in the survey. You are definitely our hero uh, in the Northeast promoting equality, promoting diversity, and setting up an example for inclusion. The first part of the report focuses on how are we feeling? Uh, these are the key findings. And I have, I'm not going to go through everything because the report is big and you can get a copy from Dynamo, but I just want to highlight a bit of um, the stats that we got. Only nine out of 143 people stated clearly that their workplace actively promotes inclusive culture. That made 6.3%. If you look at into the gender pay gap, when we asked this question, how many um, have published their gender pay gap report, only 88% of have said that their organizations do not publish the gender pay gap report, whereas 11% they were not sure. Only 1% of the people said that their organizations does publish the report. So this is something that we can look upon. I believe that this is something that is easily rectified as well. It is not something that we can't do. When we talk about the Equality Act, and this is where I would really like your attention to be, more than 41% say that they're not even aware if there's any equality diversity policy, and 92% were unaware of whether their policy was in line with the Equality Act. Now, this could be because sometimes we talk about race and gender and color so much in our organizations and publicly that we we um, we do not recognize that the Equality Act covers a lot more protected characteristics. And that's why Dynamo would like to make sure that our report focuses on everyone and we include the Equality Act. 
as in EDI training, I think this has come out as very much a highlight that people would like their EDI training to be at their organizations because it will benefit and it, it can be very helpful. Next, if you'll see throughout the report, we have always also featured our other heroes. One is Lewis Doyle, CEO and co-founder of MESMA. The, along with this, we are very, very honored to showcase some case studies as well, because as I said, while the statistics be surprising, shocking, disturbing, or not as what we were expecting, there are some brilliant work. There is some brilliant work happening in the sector, which is the first case study that we would like to feature in our report is from the Tech of Women. Uh, before we do, to, um, before I talk a lot about Tech of Women, I also would like to share um, how this program has inspired and changed so many lives in just six months. Tech of Women is an award-winning initiative. It is funded by the Institute of Coding aimed at bridging the tech and digital skills gap, created by Professor Sue Black, supported by Professor Alexandra Christia and a consortium of four UK universities, Durham, UK, Nottingham and Edgehill, and industry partners, it provides an educational program to a diverse set of women to retrain them into technology careers. We are very, very honored and privileged to have Dr. Sue Black today, whom we'll speak about uh, the Tech of Women. But if you would like to know more about the Tech of Women, please get hold of the copy and their case study is featured in it. We are very, very honored to feature the case study. One thing that I really want to highlight about Tech of Women is it serves as an example, a true example of how we can model diversity and inclusion and how we can bring in those people who are far away from tech. But yes, there is still a huge opportunity to retrain people into tech careers. I know this is for women, but there's so much opportunity we can do for the wider sector too. So thank you, Sue, for coming up with such a brilliant program and thank you to all who have participated. We also have Shakira Tahir on the panel today, who is a participant of the program. I was one of the participants of the program and my life changed through Tech of Women. So thank you. The second part of the report focuses on how are we behaving uh, within our organizations. And this focuses on that everybody working for an organization, we all have a responsibility to promote equality, diversity, and inclusion. It does not only rely or sit onto the top management or to the people who are the junior staff, it is everyone in the organization. We also have Rebecca Strachan, Deputy Faculty, uh, Faculty Pro Vice Chancellor of Engineering and Environment at Northumbria University, who is our hero, who's actively promoting equality, diversity, and inclusion. In terms of how we're feeling is EDI values. Only 6.3% say that their organization is committed to diversity and inclusion, whereas 43% say that it is not. Now, this is something that we must see. And I, I know that this can be shocking and disturbing for a lot of attendees or the people who read it. But at the same time, I see that there's a huge opportunity and there's a huge work. Uh, still work that we can do to promote and respect people from different cultures. If you look at the disabilities, approximately 50% of the people who filled the survey questionnaire strongly disagree with their management's commitment to meeting the needs of employees with disabilities. Now, this statistics provide us with the learning that there's a huge gap in understanding and meeting the needs of the people who identify themselves as either disabled or neurodiverse. And as I said, when we talk about equality diversity, the first thing is to embrace it. So this is something that we can all look on. The next hero that we have featured is Dr. Selva Kumar Ramach, who is of Hitchcock's Limited. And thank you so much, Dr. Selva Kumar, for entry as well. The third part is the sense of belonging. It's the part three uh, where we feel how authentic or true self uh, we are feeling as true in our organization. So building, I believe, a fair and inclusive workplace will not only be better for the organization and its employees, but it can also bring a positive change to the whole society. For this, we have also featured Rachel Pattinson, who's the CDT manager at School of Computing, Newcastle University, who through her work, through her amazing, uh, uh, you know, abilities and understanding of equality, she's spreading equality, diversity and inclusion. 
I would like to read her openness quote that you can always pivot into a tech role, tech role no matter what your background. And that is open. And uh, one thing that she also featured in equality by being a woman in management role, she won a Tech Women 100 award this year. So this is something that we can keep on encouraging our employees to be part of the awards that happen nationally, um, regionally, and just make sure that we support them to achieve this. When we were looking at the survey statistics of this, there were four uh, strands and one, I really want to highlight the voice where 40.8% 40, 40 of people are neutral about the fear of negative consequences while voicing out a contrary opinion, while 33.1% clearly strongly disagree. So. What I would like to say here is, as I've written in the report, that each one of us has a different story. But the one thing that we all have in common is that we all want to connect with others. We want the feeling that we are being cared for, and we always remember how me, how people make us feel. You know, we can forget what was said, what was done, but we will never forget how the other person made us feel. This was also a quote of Maya Angelou as well. So this is something that we really wanted to highlight. In terms of the balance um, and the recognition, in the balance, we found out that 61 out of 142 people, that makes 43% are neutral about their company, enabling them to have a healthy balance between their work and personal life, whereas 56 people strongly disagree and only one agree with having a balance in their personal and professional life. Looking at this statistic, it made me think, well, we've all gone through COVID, we have all adapted to new methods of working. It is a time that we all balance our personal and professional lives. This is very important. Next up on the hero list is Tom Johnson, who is a tech influencer from Northeast tech sector. His openness quote was also very attractive. It really made me think we are all one race, human. And this is something that we all must believe in as well. Diversity is the spice of life and our one true strength. So thank you so much, Tom, for highlighting this. Uh, then we have psychologically safe space. Now this figure was something very, very important that I uh, really also, and today we would speak about it with Poppy German. We have her here. 56 out of 142 responses are neutral about their being valued when they speak up at work, whereas 49 people strongly disagree, 61 people are neutral with feeling that they're the only one at the organization, whereas 68 people are neutral with worrying that they do not have things in common. Again, no one identified with strongly agreeing to being understood by their coworkers. So now this leaves us a question mark, do we have a psychologically safe space? Do we give or promote that inclusive and safe culture for everyone to speak? We all are going through some difficult times in our own lives and work is somewhere where we spend most of our time. So it's quite important that we value that. Next up is the case study from 5050 Future Limited. Again, 5050 Future Limited is a diversity and inclusion training and consultancy company that values difference. I've been with them. They was the, they've also appeared on our podcast. Please do go and have a look at them. They're brilliant, doing brilliant work in the Northeast tech sector. So thank you so much, 5050 Future. Lindsay and Lindsay Britton, who are the co-founders of 5050 Future, for letting us feature you in our um, in our report. Thank you so much. The last part was the, are we listening? Now, this is something that was very close to my heart because we're all humans. We all want to be listened. We all have stigmas and we all go through traumas. It's the time now that while we are talking about equality, diversity and inclusion, we must learn to understand and listen to the people. Work-related stress is also real, like all other stresses, and we all, many people suffer from anxiety due to work. Now, this is something uh, I would take you straight away after featuring Haley Moore, who is a STEM and tech influencer in Northeast tech sector. Again, her openness was creating an inclusive environment is the first step in creating a diverse workplace. If you look at these figures around mental health problems, 48% say that they suffer from mental health problems. And 53.5% say that they know a colleague who suffers from mental health problems. So seeing such high statistics, we must create a comfortable environment for employees to talk about their issues and feel cared for. Mental health matters. Talking matters. We all matter. 
that because if you look at the figure, ninety-eight point six percent say that they're not likely to ever discuss it with their line manager. So what is stopping them? It's the time we recognize it, and it's the time we open up to people. Mental health marathon. It is not as surprising because COVID has revealed a lot of mental health problems, a lot of mental health difficulties, stress uh, disorders. 5.6%, only eight out of 142 people feel that they are supported with their health and well-being. Now, this needs a lot of more work that we can do. But as I said, we're all very positive and we can do it. We all can be together. Um, there is a blog for you to read around neurodiversity, but to feature in this section, we are proud to feature rebalance. This is something very close to my heart as well, but we have the honor to have Poppy Jarman, who is the founder for Rebalance. This, they provide three strands of support, corporate mental health and well-being strategy development, community engagement, mental health and well-being training. They believe um, that rebalancing, it's a time we rebalance inequalities. So thank you so much, Poppy, for being here. There's a full case study around that. Um, what rebalance I really want to just highlight the first thing is the main issue around speaking about mental health is the shame, the fear and the lack of knowledge and access to support and services. It's a time that we try and break them. It's not going to be one fix. It's not a quick fix and one size does not fit at all. But people like Poppy German, people like Poppy's team and the organizations like Rebalance are working out there. It's a time that we learn good practices and collaborate more to promote equality, diversity and inclusion in the Northeast tech sector. Thank you so much, uh, Poppy, for letting us feature you. And we are very honored to feature Rebalance again. There was one beautiful thing that I want to highlight. They have got this beautiful green sari for mental health. So now, uh, you know, green is something that the color that we all relate to being uh, calm and sound please do give a read to five ways of well-being and do follow them on the instagram they have an amazing campaign around green sari from mental health where women from all over the globe and major majorly south asian women came forward and donned their green saris and openly speak about mental health and well-being so obviously i've, I've shared with you all the survey reports um the initial findings research that is undertaken by Dynamo did not find evidence that the Northeast sector is viewed significantly differently by BAM communities. The reason was because there was so less representation was the Black Asian minority community. So we couldn't find out exactly where were the problems. We will be launching our second survey uh, in, in, in a few weeks and please keep an eye on it where we would really encourage people to fill out the surveys to find out our second piece of work. Please do read it. Then we have also featured Holly Johnson, who is again working in the Northeast sector. She has literally highlighted what we are was about to say that the visible and vocal role model provides confirmation that our aspirations are achievable. In order to improve as an industry, we must be visible and open in the actions we are taking to become more diverse. There are some conclusions, there are recommendations. One thing that I really want to say is it is not the aim of this report to produce a shopping list for all of the people who are here or a recommendations for SMEs to implement. But we'd rather like to enable the Northeast tech sector to hear, reflect, and develop their response together. As I said, if we are together, we can fix it. And if we've got our own isolated um, issues and thoughts, we might not be able to tackle it in the way we would like to see it or as an inclusive sector. We would continue the work and that's been highlighted. We've also featured Rebecca Whitworth from Red Hat. There are some, there's some food for thought as well. As Emma was saying, I think because of my charity background, I really believe that kindness and um, being open and authentic about things gives us that space to work, you know, because if we don't see the challenges in our society, we won't be able to, you know, provide the need. There is a need, there is a challenge, but I believe that we can do it. So there's, so, uh, there's some things for you to read whenever, uh, you know, please feel free to read it. Um, I have also featured some two uh, lovely uh, transcriptions from the book of Rumi, two different birds flying together and how manifest uh, we manifest prejudice and Zoroastrian and the Muslim. Uh, this is something that you might find helpful. We have also done the bird cage and is just to make sure that we understand 
that I was deeply inspired by Robin D'Angelo when I was reading this, so I thought I should write it. The last thing that I would like to finish on this uh, presentation was, I was reading something from A. Helva and uh, talking about equality, diversity and inclusion, it's very, very difficult still. We still find it a bit hard when we talk about equality, when we talk about diversity, when we talk about inclusion. But I believe that it's like developing a photograph and we face the, uh, you know, when we are developing a photograph, the dark fears and the darkness of the trial is that where we face the, you know, the darkness is something that where we find ourselves where we want to be. So, once we know how to talk about it, once we are aware that it is there, once we are authentic about accepting the reality around equality, diversity and inclusion in our region, in our communities, that's where we don't know we are manifesting our greatest potential. And we are going to develop a photograph which is not acceptive only by us, but by region, but by nation and globally as well. So do remember that we can do it and we can break the negative cycle together. I would like to acknowledge everyone who has been a part of this report, everyone who's been involved, who has completed the survey, who have contributed to it, who have attended our podcast to the inclusion working group. And you can see whoever from there are, there's some notes and references for you as well. So please do follow up Tech Up Women, Dynamo, um, rebalance and 5050 future. Join us now, become a member for Dynamo Northeast, and we would like to support you. Obviously, we do not have all the fixes for your organization, but one thing that we can say is we do understand that you want to promote it. Now, the thing is, how do we promote it? So let's do it together. So thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm sorry I've taken a bit of time. Uh, I'm not. I hope I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I, I was within the time. So I will open the questions. And I think now it's the time that we'll invite our panel members. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We will have some questions in the end, but let's start our panel discussion. So thank you so much. First of all, can I just ask all of our panel members? Emma has given a, a beautiful introduction for all of you, but it would be great to hear from you so people know who you are. So I would just request everyone to uh, introduce themselves. Firstly, I would like to go to Dr. Sue Black. Hi, can you hear me, Korea? Yeah, if you can switch on your video. And yeah, it's not switching on. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying I'm not, I'm not allowed to switch it on. Oh, okay. Okay. Hi, hi. I've been allowed to switch on my video, so I'm delighted. <laughs> Lovely to see you this morning, Faria, and thanks for all the kind words about Tech Up Women, all the work that we've done. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Professor Sue Black, Professor of Computer Science and Technology Evangelist at Durham University and uh, was the lead on the Tech Up Women programme. And um, we're doing lots of work at, at Durham, particularly in computer science around diversity and inclusion and really encouraging um, particularly women, so we focused hard on, on gender to start with in terms of bringing more uh, women students and women staff into uh, the department at Durham, uh, but also thinking hard about diversity and inclusion um, overall and working with uh, uh, an external consultant to, to really help us to make the computer science department as inclusive as, as possible for everybody at Durham. Thank you so much, Sue. The next up is, can I just invite Poppy Jarman to introduce herself? Poppy. Hi, everyone, and thank you very much for inviting me. And again, all your kind words. words. Um, Sue, it's great to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's lovely to meet you, Poppy. Yeah, yeah we're <laughs> always on Twitter supporting each other, I think. So it's good to, to good to actually see you on screen. So I'm Poppy Jaman. Um, I have two roles. I'm the chief exec of an organization called the City Mental Health Alliance, um, which I'll reference later. And I'm also um, the founder of Rebalance. Thank you. Thank you, Poppy. The next is Sean from the British Business Bank. Hi, good morning, everybody. So my name is Sean Foy. I'm the UK Network Manager for the British Business Bank in the northeast of England. Um, some of you may have heard of the bank before, some of you may not, but um, 
We are owned by the British government and we have been involved in a number of funding programmes for at least the last six or seven years. Uh, most recently during the uh, COVID pandemic with things like Civils and the Bounce Back and the new RLS or Recovery Loan Scheme programme, which launched just after Easter. Um, I got to know Farrier because of the uh, quality and diversity report that we did last year around access to finance and funding for SMEs in the UK, because our, our mantra is trying to support SMEs to access funding wherever they are uh, in the UK and indeed wherever they are on their business journey. Um, and, and so uh, Farrier kindly asked me to join the event today. And, and I think it's for us, the quality and diversity is becoming increasingly important, not just um, externally and how we work with our partners, because we work through funding partners when we deliver our programmes, but also how we um, how we work internally as well is equally as important. And I was interested to hear uh, people's views and thoughts today. So thank you, Farid, for letting me join the event today. Thank you, Sean. The next up is Nick O'Reilly. Hi, everyone. I'm Nick O'Reilly. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Officer at the NHS Business Services Authority. Um, I'm also a member of our leadership team and our um, LGBTQ plus lived experience network. Um, and that's me. Thank you, Nick. And uh, Nigel? Oh, how, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I said hi, Faria. It's nice to see you again and happy Ramadan. And Sue, I'm a great fan of yours. I'm pleased to see your face today. Absolutely delighted. Thank um, you. Well, yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm absolutely delighted to be in the panel. Um, and I'm the manager of diversity and inclusion for UKI, for Sage UKI Limited. Um, it's, I have been working in the HR for 15 years and getting into the diversity and inclusion has been something which I really wanted to do. And I can see, you know, Dynamo being doing such a great work and partnering with some amazing people in here. It's a great learning opportunity for all of us outside Sage. Um, also within Sage, I lead the LGBTQ plus network, and I'm also a part of the um, ambassador of ambitious uh, of, uh, of um, ambitious with autism, and uh, I lead the LGBT strands for it. So yes, I'm looking forward to this event, taking forward from all the learnings from there. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. The next up is Shakira. Hi everyone, I'm Shakira Mustafa Tahir from the Tech Up Women program. And um, thank you, Faria, for inviting me. I'm also a content writer at HRN1 and trustee at Being Woman. And um, such a lovely day to be here today to learn and hear like uh, different perspectives from everyone. So that's just me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shakira. The last one, but not the least, is Caroline Fox. Hi there. Hi, Priya. Thanks. Um, thank you again for having us. Um, so I'm Caroline Fox. I am Global EDI Strategy Lead at Tenth Revolution Group. We are a global tech recruitment, training and consultancy business, but we were founded and still actually have our head office based in the, the northeast of England. Uh, we launched our dedicated ED&I programme at the start of last year, so we, we're still relatively early in our journey, um, but are incredibly passionate about making a real genuine difference in the tech industry and, of course, also internally within our own business. Um, so it's great to be here and hear all of the, the different perspectives from the other speakers. So thank you again for inviting us to be part of this event. Thank you, everyone. You know, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Caroline. Nigel, yes, happy Ramadan to all of the Muslims who are watching. So, yes, we started and I'm fasting, so I might <laughs> not be in my senses. It's a long fast. Happy Navratri as well, who celebrated Navratri yesterday. Happy Vesakhi to all the Sikh community who celebrated Vesakhi yesterday. And um, Happy Easter as well, the ones who uh, had Easter. And also before we start, it is quite sad news that we received this uh, week of Prince Philip passing away. So we really would like to pay a tribute to all the brilliant work that he has done for his community. So I know it's a sad time for the country, but yes, we would continue to remember him in our prayers and remember his work throughout. Um, Let's start the panel discussion. Obviously, let it be just, you know, so you've all seen the statistics. You all can get a hold of the copy. I would go to Dr. Sue Black first. Obviously, you are very much related to innovation and the innovation with innovation. It has been proven again and again that diverse teams win more often and more consistently. So why do you think that some parts of the tech sector are so late or so behind still to realize the value that diversity can bring to organizations? 
Thanks very much, Priya. Um, well, I don't think it's just parts of the tech sector. I think we're all behind where we should be uh, in terms of thinking about diversity and inclusion. And, you know, it's been really interesting. I've kind of focused but particularly on gender, but then um, over the years, uh, uh, diversity inclusion of all sorts across the last 20, probably 25 years really in my career and so you know I've really seen a, a step change happen in the last few years and I think having first of all the internet connecting people together and then social media I mean I think it's obviously the, the terrible tragic events that we've all seen happening around the world but I think previous to the internet and social media we wouldn't all be able to see those happening and I think the fact that we have been able to see how horrific they are how you know it's become very obvious to everybody how um you know just from the George Floyd um murder you know we can see from that um you know it's like everyone has the evidence right in front of them no one can deny that that happened no one can deny that that was a, a horrific um, murder that shouldn't have happened and so I think particularly for for the white community who haven't been exposed to these um, dreadful injustices um, and you know racism around the world I think now everyone's kind of woken up so the whole white community has woken up to what's actually happening and, and seeing it right in front of them has enabled um, a kind of bit of a step change to happen and you can really see that with companies now taking diversity and inclusion really seriously um, which I think hasn't really happened before. So some organisations have, but in general, I think it's mainly been a tick box exercise for lots of companies. So the way that social media has enabled millions of people around the world to, to connect around the Black Lives Matter hashtag and Me Too hashtags um, has been able to create um, a kind of like a worldwide, I guess, awareness um, of the issues um, in, a, in a more kind of personal uh, way than has happened before. Um, and so, you know, I think we're in a very interesting time now where, you know, companies, everyone is realising that we need to do something about this. And, you know, we're all kind of learning as we go along, I suppose, really. You know, I mean, I think in general, change is difficult for most people. And I think we're kind of now in a sort of accelerated change kind of mode. And so, you know, I think the, the companies that really take take the issues properly on board, that really try very hard to create an inclusive culture within the companies and um, and bring together diverse teams to solve problems. Those are the companies that are going to be successful in five years, 10 years time. And I think the companies that don't really take it seriously now are going to completely get left behind. Uh, thank you so much, Sue. I think you've highlighted the tick box exercise. So taking it from uh, to Sean, I think I would like to ask you, Sean, obviously, as Sue has mentioned, we need to go sometimes beyond hiring, not only for the sake of filling in diverse people or to just do the tick box exercise. How can we ensure that diverse employees believe they belong to the organization and they have equal opportunities to uh, be successful or you know to get promotions how do we ensure that yeah I mean I, I think probably I probably speak from our corner of the, of, of the world if you like from the British Business Bank's point of view some things that we've done is we've developed a working group with regard to quality and diversity um, of colleagues from across the bank because we have multiple divisions within the organization and senior executives and senior leaders uh, that meets regularly to uh, and they've developed a strategy and an approach with regard to equality and diversity and begun to look at things like what barriers exist for somebody who either would like to join the organization who comes from an ethnic background or is already in the organization and what challenges are those people facing and how do we overcome those that's led us to join um, we have actually signed the, the race at work charter with regard to that uh, and I would encourage other businesses to look at that and do that we've signed that last month and, and then you know we are constantly evolving and look at that and it's part of a wider program of um, we call it ESG and recently we've been doing some hackathons around that to understand what we do in terms of equality diversity uh, social impact governance um, and, and that's some of the internal things we're doing we're also looking at um, uh, the, the mix and, and the makeup of our senior leadership team. So, for example, um, Catherine Lewis Latora, who's our chief executive, is one of the few female senior you know, chief executives of any finance house in the UK. Um, you know, probably followed in the footsteps of Alison Rose, who's chief executive of the World Bank of Scotland Group. 
uh, and I used to work for RBS, so I, I had contact with Alison Rose when I when I worked for them. Um, so we have a, through that we've tried to with our uh, executive board try to get a 50-50 split in terms of gender. It's actually at 55% at the moment. Uh, my managing director has just taken on a new a new role in the last three or four months. My previous managing director running our British business investments business that ran the Future Fund that some of you may have heard of and, and run multiple programmes across the UK as part of the wider bank uh, schemes. So we have tried to really, um, as an organisation, address some of those issues but we're, we're just at the start of the journey it's not it's not a, you know it's a constantly evolving thing um it's something that um we you know we, we actively encourage applications um from uh people from ethnic backgrounds and and how do you do that you know we've started to advertise quite heavily on um sites uh, where perhaps uh you know uh, you're more likely to have people from an ethnic background looking for a job or looking for an opportunity we uh, go on to the uh, ex armed forces website lbg lbg uh, and I, I never get the initials right unless i'm terrible at it but um lbg q um uh, plus sites uh, um, sites where uh, job posting sites where uh, you might see females applying so we are trying um, and, and we would encourage, I, I think there's a, there's a shift with our, ourselves to look at our partners and what are they doing in terms of quality diversity. So if they're part of our regional funds program or they're part of our startup loans program or the multiple schemes we run, um, what are they actually doing to address those issues themselves, um, both internally and externally? How are they encouraging businesses to step forward where you have um, you know, uh, a mixed board or you may have people from an ethnic background running that business. Are you encouraging them to step forward? Um, do they feel confident enough to approach a funder about funding? So that those are some of the strands that we're trying to do, but it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. I think somebody alluded to change takes time. It, it does. Yeah. It's not something you can switch overnight. Well, that, that's some of the things we're trying to do. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean, for highlighting, especially talking about the race charter. Leading on to, you know, I would like to, because you mentioned about that you're posting your job advertisements mm -hmm. onto different sites where people can access, especially from ethnic minorities and LGBTQ yeah. plus communities. So what steps, I would like to ask Nick, you, what steps can we take to eliminate biases from our hiring process? Because we still have biases and we can't deny this. You know, so how do we eliminate? What What do you have to say about that? You're mute, uh, Nick, I'm sorry. Sorry. The first thing is to try and understand what causes the biases. So we've done a recent exercise as part of our annual diversity report. Um, our success rates at each stage of a recruitment process um, are, are now pretty equal between men and women. But there's a big drop off um, from the BEM community. So the percentage you apply and the percentage you get shortlisted and go through to interview. So in, in order to understand that, we've got to look at what might be the cause of that. Is it is it conscious or unconscious bias? Is it it's not just that we're not attracting the candidates, it's that they're not getting through the different stages of the recruitment process. Um we do historically struggle um, to get um, um, diversity in recruitment panels, particularly around race, uh, particularly in digital and technology areas. Um, so we're, we're doing an exercise um, with our um, a BAME lived experience network. Um, and part of that has shown, actually, we need to do more to support um, existing employees who who've not perhaps had the same experience of recruitment and selection. So you, you can't just ask someone to become a panel member, you have to support them in, in learning and, and being confident in being that. So I think there's that. I think the other aspect is, is, is we're re really pretty poor about thinking about how we capture feedback. So why did you apply or why, why, did, why didn't you apply is a really difficult one because they didn't apply. But, but so when we do use the research on services we do, we need to find the same way to do some user research on what are the barriers to, um, to attracting a, a, a candidates. Um, so I, I think there is a lot there. There's a lot there around um, 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 accepting that there are biases across society. There's yes. also some things about understanding what is transferable. So one of, one of my experiences 
in the last 12 months was, and for the last three years, we had really strong, powerful LGBT history months at work. And we'd had pr practically no Black History Month visibility. Um, and it was working with colleagues in our new um, BAM lived experience network. Um, you know, so how can we share ideas and collaborate, collaborate across the equality and diversity groups? So um, we're very diverse in our equality and diversity groups. And sometimes we can be better allies to each other, I think was one of those lessons. Yeah, thank you so much, Nick. You have really highlighted that why the, you know, it is important uh, to support the panelists as well, you know, when you, because I think that, that that's very much needed. I will go to Nigel, uh, uh, you know, onto this, that if you think that, uh, you know, and obviously we have seen that you've shared it on the podcast as well, a lot about ethnocentrism. As uh, so if a colleague or work is being a victim to sexist, homophobic, racist, or insensitive remarks, or the people who are applying have got this, that because of their name, ends in Muhammad or Kamran, or they might not short, be shortlisted. How do you see what should be the steps to handle this kind of situation? And how do we provide immediate support within our organizations? That is a great question. You know, there's many elements to it and I'll take all day to even explain it won't be enough. Um, I think we, there are three parts of this question. One is that why it's happening. Second is what should we do and what, and the next is support that we need. When we try to understand why is it happening, it means that the, the, we, we see racism, we see homophobic and, and ins insensitive remarks every now and then, and also discrimination against the names. But we forget one thing is that does the manager and the employees have the right tools in place, whether they're educated enough with all the things that they need before they even start recruiting anyone or engaging people. A lot of the companies, what they do is that, okay, Black Lives Matter is on. Oh my God, I'm nervous. Let's go and hire people with diverse community. They forget that whether they have the right platform to engage them. They have to, they don't have the right platform to motivate them and also to mention to retain them for a longer time. When that doesn't happen, all the things that you do just turns into a negative act from an organization. And when, it, when any of these kind of acts are happening, the, it is important as a support that we have a fair place and a safe place to talk, as you mentioned in your first introduction. And I always tell my manager, there are three things to keep in mind. One is, what, what is that big elephant that we're not talking about? Second is, what's the dead fish? A dead fish is something that, which has happened a couple of years back, but you still lingers in your head. Third is about, about what you really want to hear, what you want to talk, what is there in your deep heart that you want to share. And creating that space and letting people talk about it not only helps you as an organization, but also the managers participating to learn how they should be acting, how they should be behaving in, in the regular workplace. As initial steps, every organization should have a fair treatment of any kind of discrimination happening, whether it's sexism, whether it's even microaggression or micro incivilities, even telling an, and telling a black community or a girl saying, you know, you're too good looking for your color. These are microaggressions. And, and, this, and, and that should be treated with starting from an informal discussions. It is an experience that sometimes other people don't understand. And, and it is important, that, yes, it is easy to call out in these incidents, but it is more important to give the other person an opportunity to first understand what is the difference between the experience that he has gone through and what me as a white person would have not gone through, for an example. And second is that if that doesn't solve, then take it to the formal step of grievance handling. There is an em employee should never be victimized for raising complaints as this would counter discrimination and makes the matter worse. Um, dealing any kind of grievances usually a sensitive matter to make sure that we have someone in the team to manage that diligently. And, and UK Employment Tribunal awards and discrimination cases and things are there in place. So the organization should take care of all these things end to end. Okay, thank you so much, Nick. Uh, so sorry, thank you so much, Nigel. Because you've spoken about safe place, uh, the big elephant and the dead fish. That uh, so I would uh, take it further to Poppy, 
uh, as well, Poppy, because Poppy has done so much work around talking about mental health, creating a safe space. So how important do you think, Poppy, it is for us to make a safe space for employees where they can share any conflict, anything that they have a grievance against or any relationship problems with our seniors? Yeah, thank you, Faria, and really, really fascinating discussion. So, look, if we can't foster an environment where belonging is 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 created, um, then our our and if our if our sense of belonging is disrupted. So, if I'm in an environment, whether it's the workplace, in my family in my community and I am othered. So to Nigel's point, I actually don't feel like I can relate to this organization. There aren't other people that look might like me. I'm having to leave a part of my personality at the door as I walk into the office environment when we could go into the office environment. Um, then actually I don't feel a strong sense of belonging. And when that belonging is disrupted, you know what happens is we have we have identity conflict i guess and when our when internalized <clears throat> when that is internalized we're at a higher risk of mental health uh, conditions and issues developing and it's for me it's that simple really so when we're including everyone and when we're creating an organization and a culture where people can bring their best ideas because they don't they feel like actually i can bring the most radical idea to my boss, to my team, and it won't be ridiculed. We get in businesses and organizations that innovate. But if you create that, that culture where people can bring their best ideas, they can also bring up issues when things are going wrong. And I don't necessarily believe that they need to get to grievance levels because actually if you've got there, it's too late. What you haven't done is you haven't created an, a culture where for human flourishing. And for me, I've worked in the workplace world, world and creating mentally healthy workplaces around the world for the last 15, 16 years. And before that, I was the founder of Mental Health First Aid in this country. And um, I've helped set up mental health organizations in, in Bangladesh, Uganda. My, my, my organization, the City Mental Health Alliance, is in Australia, Singapore, Hong Kong. Um, we've uh, setting up in India and um, New Zealand and US. So, and, and this is all within the financial services sector. So these are major banks, um, professional services um, organizations and these organizations and these chief executives aren't doing this because it's just the right thing to do of course it's the right thing to do but it makes complete business sense and the reason why I say that is we've got data sh to show that 45 billion pounds is lost per year this is pre-pandemic in the UK businesses um, um, because of poor mental health. So when you create an, uh, a f when you foster belonging, when you encourage people to come to the workplace and bring all of themselves if they want to, whether uh, the identity is Muslim, whether the identity is LGBTQ, whether it's actually an intersectionality of all of that and mental health issues, you create pe an environment where people give everything because they're loyal and they're committed and when you create that you get innovation and that's where business success organizational success sits so for me doing mental health work in the workplace is about it's always about inclusion but it's it's about innovation as well and and just a few other things on, on that before i sort of pause you know, the data that I've given is pre-pandemic. We know that the utilization of mental health support services went up by 300% during the peak of the pandemic. World Health Organization has said that mental health issues are, is the second biggest thing that we're going to have to deal with once we've got a grip of the pandemic related issues. So every leader, whatever sector you're in, this is a boardroom issue for you now. And I speak and say that with confidence. You know, I 
Last July, I held an event with 40 chief executives of banks and the, me and Charles Randall, the chair of the Financial Conduct Authority, we co-chaired this event and we're about to have, an, have the second event. And Sean, I'm thinking I should probably invite you to this event when it when it takes place. But we 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 did three things. We said to these the, the chief executives, you know, it wasn't a financial conduct authority saying you must do this. It was for FCA saying we've we're struggling with how to create belonging, include our people, and make this a safe space where people can talk about their mental health struggles, whether it's kicking off because of the racism that's being highlighted in society, or whether it's the inequalities of the pandemic disproportionately impacting black and brown communities and Bangladeshi communities, for example, specifically, which is where I'm from. You know, we need to talk about this and we need to work out how to do this together. So it was an allyship conversation. It wasn't a finger wagging, blaming conversation. And the reason why that's important is nobody has solved this. We're a long way from solving it. Anyway, these 40 chief executives went away and they did three things. They've put mental health on the boardroom agenda. They've put it, created mental health and well-being and health as part of their risk reg register with mitigating steps. And they've provided appropriate resourcing for mental health and well-being into their organization. So if you had an IT problem in a business and lost five million pounds a year, what would you do? You would apply business acumen because you're business leaders. So you'd put in a strategy, you'll get the best experts in the room, you'll build a three year plan and you'll change that system because you're losing money. That's exactly what's happening with mental health and DNI. And so that's what our businesses I'm seeing doing around the world. And I and I say that, you know, the chief exec of Microsoft is our chair in Australia. Um, the chief uh, chief exec of Lansdowne, uh, uh, an investment organization, is our chair in this country. So uh, so so this is business critical and forward thinking businesses are doing this really well. I've put a number of links up on the chat function that will take you to our race equality and mental health toolkit that will take you to my personal commitments around mental health, because the other thing I will say is we can't create change by just create saying this is a systems issue and the systems need to change. Leadership behavior needs to change. So I will now no longer sit on any panel without asking the question, how many women are on this panel? It has to be minimum 50%. And how many brown people, black and brown, diverse, is, it, is the panel ethnically diverse? It has to be 20%. And I've made mistakes. Sometimes I've gone on panel and realized it's too late. But yesterday I said to my EA, if any, if I get asked to do any events externally, I want you to ask, send them my leadership commitments and ask them to respond to that. And if it's appropriate, if it's, you know, it might be an all men event, for example, and that's okay. But I need to ask that question up front before I engage. And I also need to sponsor people's careers. It's not enough to say we've put in a mentor mentoring scheme and we've put a leadership program and here are these black people or LGBTQ people that are, you know, they're just not getting it. Actually, you need to sponsor someone's career to get to the top. Um, I've put in a link for an organization called Race Ray Change the Race Ratio, which I helped launch, which is speaking exactly to that. So I think leadership behavior is crucial for this. And I'll, and I'll pause there because otherwise I could go on forever. Thank you so much, Poppy. I think that was very thought provoking. Uh, a lot of things that you've highlighted. So, and I think what you have just mentioned about your leadership commitments, that's the same when we were uh, putting up a panel for Dynamo for this today's event. We wanted to make sure there is representation from black Asian minority, but also there is equal thing. And I think you are very right. It's the time we must have our leadership commitments to promote equality diversity. Um, obviously you have mentioned uh, about creating a safe space. I would like to lead on to Shakira um, because Shakira, I would like to ask you sometimes still people from underrepresented communities, especially black Asian minority ethnic communities, they still feel scared to come forward. Um, no matter how talented they are, uh, how can we make sure we reach out to them proactively, source candidates? Obviously, Poppy has highlighted a lot of issues and Nigel and Sean and everybody has put in some light on the recruitment processes. But even recognizing myself as an Asian person living in Northeast, it is difficult. I still have, uh, you know, I still have this fear that, oh, I'm not good enough. How do we 
tackle this, Shakira? Um, well, I mean, like for anyone that wants to even like go into you know a career or like pick on a role, the first thing they do is to go on like job sites to see where exactly I fit in. So that's where um, the use of industry jargon in job ads come in, right? So um, the language and job description makes you question: Do I have the skills? And like um, you know, research has shown that women only apply for jobs if they feel 100% in the criteria, whereas men will apply even when they feel like 60%. So, I mean, like, definitely when um, the job descriptions are universal and not complicated, it encourages people to feel I can fit in that role. I mean, I've had like a couple of my share of like um, discouraging times where I'm like, oh, should I even finish this application process? I feel I don't, you know, connect with that. And um, that's the first reason I feel. And the other one is the misconception that like tech is only for smart people. You know, like, and when you when you don't have like the tech related education and qualification, you just feel out of place. And um, you know, the only thing to you know, nobody wants to go into something they feel they can't do. So I feel like that mis misconception and just feeling like there's no place for me. Whereas you know, the old tech, the idea of um, equality, diversity, inclusion is to ensure that every single person is included because. At the end of the day, we are creating something that works for everyone. And, you know, I wouldn't want to apply no matter how talented I am. And it would be discouraging to me to feel like well, I can't do the job, right? So, like, I feel that that part of it is discouraging. Then we also have an um, issue of lack of trust in data collection process. Um, according to um, Diverse and Equality Black Tech um, research on, on recruitment bias feedback, there was... Um, regarding the issue of ethnicity, uh, Black applicants specifically don't trust that data collection during application process won't work against them. I mean, a clear expectation of, I mean, people want to know what this data are collected from. I don't want to feel like I'm applying for a job and like I don't quite tick this thing. So like the question being asked definitely would limit me from getting the role. So ultimately what we are saying is that, you know, we, we should definitely, um, you know, make sure the reasons for collecting certain data when applying for roles, especially for the people of ethnicity is clear. So it encourages them to, you know, you know, to just put in their data there. I mean, that, that, that part of it. And we also have this feeling of uncomfortable, um, feeling uncomfortable at networking events. I feel that that is a very, very interesting point um, because um, everyone knows networking is important part of finding any job. And either, if you don't feel like you're not, you know, you're not going to, if you don't feel like you're very good at networking or if you're not even good at it, you're not going to get the job in the first place, right? So um, I feel just the idea, just the idea that you won't be taken like seriously if you don't look as geeky or like maybe if you're going for a networking event and you know, the, the issue of lack of representation is already low. And when you get there, you don't quite feel like you, there are similarities and you, you won't be able to build that meaningful connection that will take you to the next step. So I feel, those are major reasons. I feel a lot of people that are talented would shy away. Just you know, everyone wants to feel like they belong in a you know in anything you do in a job role in a society or something like that. So I feel just being aware that whatever networking event, even if it's um, going to be like um, um, everything should be like more inclusive and people should feel like they're represented there. So that's my point of view. Thank you so much, Shakira. You've highlighted very. Uh, authentic and real challenges that we face when we are holding recruitment or we are when we are promoting equality, diversity, and inclusion. I would like to lead on to Caroline now. So Caroline, obviously you're coming from the 10th Revolution Recruitment Group. It's a global organization. How do you see that the challenges my um, uh, panelist members have highlighted, especially recruitment? And if you look at our, the report, there was a gender pay gap uh, highlighted as well. So how do you think an organization can actively promote pay equity or, uh, you know, equal chances of recruitment for people yeah. from diverse backgrounds? Thanks, Maria. I think um, when it comes to, to data reporting, you've just got to be completely transparent. And, you know, if there is a, a gender pay gap or indeed any other pay disparity, you know, it's not always just gender. Don't hide the reality and, you know, be, be open and honest about it. Publish everything in the most open way that you can. Um, I think, 
you have to embrace internal monitoring of pay structures, you know, make sure that you're conducting frequent reviews to make sure that you're keeping on top of changes over time. Um, and, you know, a number of people have said in response to their, their own questions, this is a continuous process, you know, we will never tick the box and say that's done, we're, we, you know, we're, we're past it. Um, but make a business commitment to consider possible pay gaps at all processes of the employee life cycle. So whether that's at the point of hiring, promotion, creation of new roles, make sure that is being considered um, and implementing very clear and transparent structures of pay and um, help everybody understand you know what where they stand what they're working towards and what a structure is within their organization but possibly the most important is if you identify a problem do something about it you know don't just sit on it and accept it don't shrug your shoulders and say you know oh we've got a gap and um, do something about it and act on it as quickly as you as you possibly can, um, because the sooner you start to take those real affirmative actions towards making a difference, the sooner you will start to close that gap. And, um, you know, that that's where you really start to see the change when organisations actually accept a problem and do something about it. Thank you so much, Caroline. And I think uh, if we talk about it, the discussion will go on and on and we are very, very short of time. But uh, so I would obviously I have so many questions, but, you know, we could only fit in what the time is. So. I would just like to end up in asking all of the panelists to have some food for thought, obviously the way we have done in the food for thought. And I, I, I might sound, you know, I'm a big, big, big fan of Rumi and spiritual findings. And I believe that we, yes, we are talking equality, diversity now, but it has been there hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and rather than just trying to do, you know, talk about it it's a point as Carolina said it's the time we back up our statements with actions we do something about it uh, let's not just sit over it and be transparent and open you know accept that there is a gap and yes we can do it because I see that there's definitely a possibility we can do it so I would go back to Sue any food for thought for our attendees and then we'll move on to the questions. Thanks very much Maria well it's just been wonderful listening to everybody and uh, so much wisdom here um, so what a wonderful group of uh, people that you've got together. So thanks very much for it, for inviting me to be part of it. I think, you know, just we're in a time, like I was saying, where change is happening quite rapidly. And I think exactly the, you know, your hero acronym, I just love it, you know, because that, that's the, what, what we all need to be, you know, to be honest, uh, focus on equality, respect and, and openness and just creating spaces where everyone can be honest and open about everything with a kind of a good heart which I know is exactly what you're like Maria. Um, we need to, to create those spaces for everybody to be able to talk about these issues so that we can just be honest and straightforward and, and not worry that we're saying the wrong thing or offending people um, and at the same time be open to people telling us that we are offending them if we are you know so so that we can kind of get over those those barriers which I think a lot of us have got in our heads around having difficult conversations and I think I think openness and a good heart are just really really key to to making that happen and also we need to be active good allies I think um to each other so if we see ourselves in the majority so like you know like Shakira's talking about networking and stuff I remember how hard that was being in the sort of 10% women uh, in a male dominated conference, for example, trying to, to network with people and um, just not getting the response that I was expecting uh, and not having a great time at conferences. And then being in the majority at an all women uh, science conference and just having such an amazing time. I think we need to, if we see ourselves being in the majority and we at, at a conference, um, if we ever get to meet up in groups again, <laughs> Uh, and not just online, um, to, to be an active, good ally and to, you know, look out for people that may be standing on their own at a conference and go over and just start a chat with them uh, and help them to feel more comfortable and more included in the event. And I think inclusion is just so important. And to, um, I think, Poppy and, and Nigel's comments around, um, you know, we need to create a space where people feel that they can be themselves at work. And it's just so critically important um, for us as individuals, but also for organisations to be um, successful. And my last thing is we need to create lots of pathways, pathways for people to get into the workplace in various different job roles. And that's what we've done with Tech Up Women, um, two of our stars here, Euphrea and, and Shakira. 
um, and you know create pathways where they don't exist so that so that it's a kind of smoother transition from so with tech up women from being a woman with massive potential um, a pathway into being able to work into um, in technology um, and working with all the relevant stakeholders and partners to to create those those pathways. Thanks. Thank I'll, you I'll so stop much. There. I go on <laughs> thank, stop there. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Sue. It has always been lovely to hear, and thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, I would go on to Nick uh, because uh, Nick, what is your food for thought for today? So, my food for thought is um, it is about networking. It's, a, it, it's very much about how we network and how we open up networks. It's, it's, a, it, it's about the ecosystems that we work in. And one of the things I think we've got to challenge ourselves is, is um, do we have the right network? So um, something I, I you know, constantly challenge myself is, is, is I'm regularly asked to promote job opportunities on LinkedIn. Um, but I'm promoting that to my network, which is not very diverse. So that you need to think about how you network, how you interact with people, what are your connections, and, and changing those connections, making those connections more open. Um, so I think it is how we work across networks and work with each other. Thank you so much, Nick. Sean, your food for thought. I guess I would go back to that comment about we are just at the start of a journey. It's you never, I think Caroline alluded to the fact that you, you know, you never say so you've ticked the box or oh, and that that's done and and it isn't it is about uh being prepared a challenge um I, we have our own um as part of a network team of around 30 managers we have our own um quality and diversity drop-in group that we have a, a monthly session and one of the colleagues said that um she was nervous about challenging uh, the makeup of a, a, a panel she was asked to join uh, because it was um, nearly all white males in their 40s and 50s, to be perfectly frank. And we were trying to encourage you, well, actually go back and say, I don't think I can be part of this panel if you haven't got, as Poppy was alluding to, you haven't got people from different uh, ethnic backgrounds. Um, uh, where's the gender split on this? Uh, and be prepared to do that. Um, so that, that, that uh, I think challenge has to be important. It's challenge for us, challenging internally, challenging externally. Uh, if you see um, practice or behaviour that, that that breaks a, a diversity policy um, or, or you just don't think it's right, we all know when it's not right, be prepared to challenge uh, and be prepared to step forward. That, that, that would be my, my thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank you so much, thank Sean. You. Nigel. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you, uh, Faria, for inviting me and introducing me to such people in the panel. I definitely would like to connect personally and officially too. Um, and I know that there are a lot of people in the call as well as members and also invitees who have not, not must have experienced diversity and inclusion as a whole and how to do things. And my food of thought is that just look around. You swap a lot of things on LinkedIn, Twitter and things. Have you noticed so many things are happening around the globe? The mother of Sarah Everett's case, Meghan Markle and the refusal of many white people to acknowledge this certain form of racism. Then you have the government dragging its feet on bringing the forward the legislation of the ban of LGBT therapy, a surge of anti-Asian uh, hate and killing of eight people, institutional racism being uncovered at the highest level of pride in London. And, and these are the small things which we see. When you look around, just remember one thing. You have one representation of each people gone through in your organization. How are they feeling? what they really need to forget from, the, from you as an organization head or someone who really look forward to get a support at that time. Pandemic has made us be vulnerable, has made people fragile. T picking up Poppy's comment, mental health has always been important, but we always care to talk about. And now people are coming out and sharing their experiences. We should take this opportunity where we take, create a platform, not only now, but also in future. Create levels of platforms, just not, you know, hearing people are doing pulse surveys, but making DNI as an agenda, even in small meetings, team meetings, in your all hands meet, in your, uh, in your corporate social responsibilities are such a small thing. Like your charity is amazing. NGOs, there's several NGOs are there for even autism and all. 
participate in that and support the community. It is a start of a DNI journey, and that will be my food of thought. Thank you, Faria. Thank you so much, Nigel. And I think I'd really say yes, charities. You know, you've you've said so much. You know, I, I'm always hugely inspired by you. Whenever you know, it's see things. And as I said, there's so much misconceptions people had around charities, and me being the founder of a charity. This is something that we have broken up, the broken the stereotype within one month. That no charities can be innovative. They can partner with public organizations. They can have innovative projects. They can dress up the way they want. And you know, charity is not only the word. It is about understanding people and connecting to them. Shakira, what is your food for thought for today? Well, thank you, Faria, once again. It's uh, my my food for. My, my food for thought is um, it's not enough to get a lot of people from different ethnicity into the, you know, like the team. It's about how you support them, how, how they feel like they belong so they can give the best of themselves in, you know, wherever team you define themselves. And I'll be speaking in like in light of Tech Up Women program. And I'm so happy to see profs uh, still here again. And, you know, it's like we, we 100 people came into a program where we, I went there with doubt and it was like the first day I was like, I don't know if I would be able to even go through with this and just seeing people open up and seeing a bit of yourself in every other person, right? From the mentorship to the community, to the support. And like the program has been done for um, absolutely for a year now. And it's like, I could still call anyone from the program and say, oh, this is where I'm at. I need something or like, do you know how I can go through with this? Which was what I did yesterday. And seeing how we've been able to, you know, move forward from there, I still keep in touch with Faria and Faria, you know, she said some really inspiring things to me about like being in the program and how, you know, those things are little things, but people don't know those are things that encourage people to be a part of this kind of team. You know, you don't want to feel like you have less to offer. And I feel we, we programs coming up these days about like making sure people are, you know, trained in certain fields. There should also be the support to, you know, make them carry on from there. It shouldn't be just, you know, train as a, you know, tech participant or something like that. And I feel like Tech Up Women has been able to do that for me. And um, yeah, so that's my photo. Like the support should be there. And like people should see a bit of themselves in any community they, you know, they find themselves in. People shouldn't feel left out. And we need everyone, you know, we need to, if you're talking about equality, diversity and um, inclusion, we need everyone in the system to be there. Everyone has, you know, a role to play. And I, I, I really commend Tech Up Women for, you know, the, the amazing support, you know, and you know, not only that, like there's some mentors I met on the program and it's like been a year and they still send me messages, you know, just to see how I'm doing and, you know, how they can, you know, help out and all that. So it's, it's, just, it's just about feeling like you're involved in something like this, like being a part of the change. So that's Thank you my so opinion. much. Thank you so much, Shakira. And yes, Tech Up Women is no doubt a life-changing program. Uh, please do visit Tech Up Women, do read the case study and please be a part of Tech Up Women next time. It will change your life. And yes, there will be inspiring people. But one thing that I've learned from Tech Up Women is you can be inspired from everyone. So many. I'm hugely inspired by all of you, but one must find their own path. And if you find your own path, you are also on the journey to inspire so many. So thank you for teaching me and helping me do that. Uh, Caroline, what's your food for thought for today? I'm going to have two if I'm allowed. Um, my, my first is just do something. Um, if, you're at, if you're at the start of your journey or indeed anywhere on this journey, doing something small it is better than doing nothing at all. We have to actually take action and make a real change. So be be brave and you know be be prepared to be a bit uncomfortable um welcome criticism and learn from it because nobody's perfect nobody has got this down and, and it, you know this, the problem isn't solved um you know we've said numerous times throughout this session that the this is a continuous journey and it will always be changing um and my second point is um it's not enough just to solve the the outcome we have to look at what happens behind the the problem that we've identified so for example if your problem is that you maybe don't have equal representation of women in leadership the solution is not just to hire more women into leadership roles it's to address the pro processes and the policies behind to make sure that the outcome it, you know it's not just a, a cosmetic outcome that says look here, here's our women in leadership we actually have to solve the, the processes that lead to that problem in the first place um, and that that's the hard bit and you know that's the really long uh, long time consuming aspect but it's the bit that will have the most impact 
Thank you so much, Caroline. Fixing the root cause is something that we all should do. Thank you so much. And last but not the least, thank you so much, Poppy, for taking valuable time out of your busy life today. What is your food for thought? Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go one up on Caroline and do three, if that's OK. <laughs> um, um, so my three thoughts are, first of all, is stewardship. You know, we as managers, leaders, uh, slightly older people in organizations have to have the courage to start a strategy that outlives our tenure. When you when you do DNI work, mental health work, you know, this sort of short termism approach isn't going to work. We have to be stewards of the agenda and leave aim to leave this place better than we found it, whatever that place is. So pay it forward and stewardship is my number one. Number two is allyship. We've all mentioned it in one form or another. And I would say it is a great privilege to remove the barriers you yourself did not experience. I've experienced racism. I've experienced sexism. I've experienced sexual harassment, but I've experienced mental health discrimination, but I've never experienced physical disability discrimination. And I, I'm so privileged and I have to recognize my privilege that if I can remove the barriers for, for those people who may be a wheelchair user, for example, then that is a, an honor. It is not a burden. And actually, if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing my job right. So I would say allyship is really crucial and do it with compassionate dialogue. And what I mean by that is you know, recognize that there's a problem. We all do, we're all advocating for it. Interrupt your th thought processes and your feelings, like understand why is it that you're reacting to this? Nick made a really great point earlier, you know, or, um, the jobs are being advertised all the time, but actually recognizing that his networks doesn't actually include a lot of people that he's trying to reach. So changing that and looking at that with curiosity and then repairing that. So compassionate dialogue approach to allyship. And finally, I would say accountability. Like I am so done with this philosophical discussion. It's not a philosophical discussion. There isn't a business case to be one on aware. That's all been done. It's been done for the last 20 years. Um, so you have to get accountability. And for me, that is about board level responsibility. That is about measuring so how we are socializing the agenda, how we are skilling up the workforce and how are we going to sustain this going forward. So without those three things, I don't think anything's going to change. So that's my food for thought. And to Caroline's point, lastly, brave, not perfect. We're not going to get this right. Like we're not, we're human beings. <laughs> So let's just be brave and not aim to be perfect and apologize when it goes wrong. And then add compassionate dialogue and a compassion to ourselves, forgive, address, move on and, and seek to repair. Thank you so much, Poppy. What a brilliant, uh, you know, you've highlighted and shed light on a lot of, you know, deep things. So there's so much to take. My food for thought before we move on to questions would be, we have seen today, we see it every day, we are all different. I am not a good user of LinkedIn and I accept it. I'm not, you know, and I think Sue always says, I'm not very good on Twitter. And, you know, I accept it. I can't do everything. But if you ask me to do something for the charity or come up with a project, I'll do it. You know, so that I think we all need to understand we can't do everything. We all have our unique abilities. Find that uniqueness in you. That's the same difference that we all have is binding us together. The same difference that I have in the Northeast as it has binded me to the tech industry, Dynamo Network, to loads of other people. So identify that you are different, be proud of it and accept it. You know, there's no harm in it. So thank you so much, all the panelists. Thank you so much, Emma. We also have on call uh, today, we had uh, two questions in the Q&A uh, and they've been answered by Nick. So thank you so much. They were asked by Thea. Uh, it was just that if somebody else would like to answer, I would repeat the questions from a question from Thea. What do the panelists think about forcing diversity through positive discrimination in recruitment and promotion? Does anybody would like to answer that? So I don't, is the question, sorry, what, so, so repeat the question, forcing diversity 
through Which positive one? discrimination in recruitment and promotion. I know it's a controversial subject, but could it be a good way to guide companies out of their apathy and towards addressing their lack of representation across positions? So I, I think the question is saying making uh, in diversity and inclusion and mental health and inclusion and the intersectionality, all of that uh, mandatory. I think I so I, uh, you know, I'm ambivalent about it. I think it depends on your on your culture of your business. So if your business or organization is system uh, is target led, then then absolutely. But I do think it needs to be a boardroom agenda and then the strategy needs to be around creating the space for people to grow um but if you're not measuring it how how on earth are you going to know you're going to create change so i guess i'm saying i don't i don't like the word force but i think if it's important you're going to do it aren't you <laughs> and it's going to be on the boardroom agenda so it i guess it for me it tells you a very clear picture of whether you're a good employer or not and i don't think future you're going to be able to attract talent without being explicit about inclusion mental health you're just not so i guess it's up to the business leaders to decide whether they want to be successful in here 10 years from now or not um i know that's not quite answered the question but um no problem i think nick has also answered the question um just to close up the session, we're just going to wait for another five minutes for any question and answers. But I would like to share with you a beautiful video um, of Tech Up Woman to highlight everything and to just to, you know, get some break of talking as well. We've all been speaking. So as well, uh, let me just share with you the lovely video of Tech Up Woman. Hopefully there's no sound on the video. Sorry. Um, sorry, is there no sound on uh, the video, Claire? No. Do you want me to share it from my screen? Yes, yeah, if you yeah. can share. Thank you. Welcome to Tech Up Women. <laughs> There's not a lot of retraining into tech courses around, and I think that's one thing that's really, really missing. We really want to change the way that people see women in tech. This has been nine months in the making. 200 women applying for 100 places. What we want is women with potential, and I think that's what we've got. Hi, I'm Nina. My name is Edna. This is my baby girl. I've been deaf since the age of four. I always had a hidden aspiration for working in computing. The modules sound like just what I need to get me into this field. I want to do this not just for me, but for other girls and women. We're looking at women from underrepresented communities, underrepresented backgrounds, so BAME women, women with disabilities. We had teachers, we had doctors. There's artists in there. We had undergraduates, we had PhDs. Solicitors, bankers, mums. A hundred women who have all of these incredible skills and backgrounds. It's truly inspiring. 
It's a demanding programme. There is a huge amount of content to learn over six months. Four different roles that we're training women into. So we're data scientist, agile project manager, business analyst, software developer. We've had coaching, activities that I'd never have dreamed of. We've got four residentials. Being able to network, meet like-minded people. We have mentoring in place, one-to-one -one mentoring. You get to really get under the skin of all of the participants. I'm so honoured to be talking to all of you today and I'm so happy to see a room full of women who want to pursue a career in computer science. Tech Up has really transformed my life. Because it's been done by women, led by women, it's been done in a special way. I feel empowered. I can believe in myself. I'm more curious and enlightened. I'm resilient. That's what I've learned. My confidence rocketed and I managed to get two different job offers and I accepted. A brilliant one. I think it's gonna really change going forward with my career, my future. I knew it was going to be transformational, but I didn't realise that it would also be that way for me as a speaker. This whole programme has been amazing. It's got a great atmosphere. I've been so impressed by the women I've met. Look out world, because I, I'm frightened about how they're gonna change it once they're out there. This has been the first. I really hope it won't be the last fight a long, long margin. You know, I'd love to do this for thousands of women, not just a hundred women. We're looking at a big impact, so bring it on. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you so much, Naya. Nigel, thank you so much, all the panelist members. I also would like to say uh, a huge thank you to Claire, uh, who have been, you know, pushing the blogs out on as so on social media. As I said, I'm not very good on social media. I still have a lot of learning to do. But yes, Claire has been an amazing sport throughout the EDI project. She's been posting blogs, spreading the messages. As I said in the beginning, we will be launching our second. Uh, um, second survey the second piece of work please do spread it so we get more and more responses thank you so much sean for your time sue for your time shakira caroline and uh, nigel and all of these attendees who have taken time out to attend this event we cannot fix it ourselves we need to collaborate and let's do it together this is not a rocket science equality diversity inclusion is human if you are human you want to do it, we'll do it. It's not something that we can build. It's been with us if you're born. So thank you so much, everybody. I would let you all go. Uh, I'll stick around for another four minutes if there are any questions, but please feel free to leave. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks very much, Maria and everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Sue.